Well, thanks, Larry. Thanks for doing this. Thanks to everybody for coming. Frank, thank you for joining me here. Uh, my name is Connor Eldridge. I'm running for the United States Senate because I want to stand up for Arkansas every day. We need strong new leadership in the Senate. We need somebody who's going to stand up and speak out and engage on issue after issue. That's why I'm in this race. Uh, we have a fundamental difference of opinion in this race as to the job of the U.S. Senator. I believe it's to show up and fight for pe the people of Arkansas day in and day out on issue after issue. Um, I'm glad Frank is here today. I uh, appreciate you for joining me. I wish Senator Bozeman had been able to make it. Uh, the Senate went out of session yesterday until Monday at 3 o'clock, so I have to believe he is in Arkansas, and it's unfortunate that he's not here. But that goes to the difference in this race. We need a senator who's not going to be absent and one who's going to engage on issue after issue, and that has never been more important. Today you pick up the paper and you see that uh, Arkansas has slipped to 49th in median income in this country. That's just simply unacceptable. That means that less than half of families in Arkansas make below $42,000 a year for a family of four. We've got to have an answer to those families. We also have 550,000 out of 2.8 million in the state, about 20% of families that are below the poverty line of $24,000 a year. What's our answer to those families? How, what's our answer for the opportunities that they and their kids should have? That's what's at stake here. The United States Senate and Washington should pay attention to that. Incumbents who have been there for too long are not paying attention to it. I'm running for the Senate to provide answers to those real problems and to lead on behalf of our state. Thank you, Mr. Allard. Mr. Gilbert, two minutes opening statement. Thank you, and I would also like to thank everybody who's involved in making this happen today. I know there are a thousand places you could have been, a thousand things you could have been doing. I'm glad you're here. I'm a former coroner, constable, and mayor. And that brings up the question, what is a two-bit local politician doing running for the United States Senate? And the answer is that I'm not just a former office holder at the local and county level. I'm also a father and a grandfather. And as I look at our country, I have to admit myself and to my generation that this country is not as good as it was when I was your age. It is not as strong as it was when I was your age. And that is somebody's fault. It is the fault of my generation. And I would like to make it up to you. There are things that the Congress of the United States need to do. The Senate in particular has failed in its job. It has not used its oversight to control the Pentagon, the alphabet agencies that the federal government operates. It has not kept us out of foreign entanglements. It has not done the things that make a free people strong. I believe it is incumbent on us to nominate and elect people at this point in time who will do things dramatically differently than we have done it in the past three or four decades. If you believe that the country is on the right course and strong, then vote Democrat. If you believe we need change, vote Libertarian, vote for Frank Gilbert. Thank you. First question, we'll start with Mr. Gilbert, and then we'll go to Mr. Elvis. Um, an incumbent is running in a, in a state that seems to be Republican, red, green, conservative. What reason is there to unseat an incumbent, this incumbent, and why do you think you, do you, think you can do it? I do believe I can do it. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. The reason I believe it needs to be done is because the senator of this deeply red Republican state is not acting like a Republican. He is one of 20 Republicans who crossed the aisle and voted to fund Obamacare. Without our senator's vote, Obamacare would have gone bankrupt long before now. It's going to go bankrupt eventually. The sooner it happens, the better. 
if you are a Republican, if you are a conservative, you need to vote Libertarian in this election because there is no Republican representative. And I don't mean simply because he's not here today. I mean he doesn't act like a Republican when he reaches the halls of Congress. Mr. Alvarez. I'm in this for all Arkansans, and there are serious issues at stake that I'm glad that uh, Frank and I are here to talk about today. But it's time that we change course. It's time that we have new leadership. It's time that incumbents who have been in Washington for too long, like Senator Bozeman, uh, are replaced. So we have the energy and attention we need to deal with the serious challenges that we face as a state and as a country. One minute of Mr. Gilbert, response. I don't believe I could add anything to what I and Connor said. Mr. Albert. Ready to move on to the issues too. Okay. Um, one of the issues that um, um, is discussed in Arkansas, a potential ballot issue, is also a hot issue nationwide, is medical marijuana. Where do each of you stand on two parts of the marijuana issue? One, medical marijuana. Do you think it should be legalized, uh, period, in the nation, but especially in Arkansas? How will you vote on that? And second, what about recreational marijuana usage? And I think we started with Mr. Gilbert, we'll start with Mr. Eldridge. Well, I am in favor of a responsible medical marijuana program in Arkansas and nationally. And for me, this is a personal story, and I think this is common with many of the Arkansans I've talked to. Um, unfortunately, we all have folks in our lives, most of us, that have been touched by cancer. And my stepmom uh, had breast cancer, beat it, had a recurrence, and died from it. And I don't understand how in 2016 in this country, if marijuana would have helped her, uh, as many medical experts believe it would have, deal with her pain, ease her suffering, and battle cancer, we shouldn't tell her no. We need to make it legal uh, for medicinal purposes with a responsible program that contains a lot of the risks uh, that are there. As a prosecutor, I have that view, and as a prosecutor, uh, I prioritized other, in my mind, more serious drug trafficking problems over marijuana. Those included methamphetamine, cocaine, uh, the opioid crisis that we have. Uh, and so the other thing I think that needs to happen nationally is that marijuana needs to be changed in the DEA schedule. Right now it's at the most serious schedule, Schedule 1, ahead of cocaine, ahead of other very uh, serious drugs, so that needs to be revisited. And bottom line, we need a, need a responsible medical marijuana program that makes it available to people like my stepmom. Mr. Gilbert, medical marijuana? Thank you for that question. I'm in your backyard for free. The pharmaceutical companies charge $3,800 for it. If that's not criminal, it should be. The criminals are the pharmaceutical companies and the politicians who have been bought off and continue to force the American people to suffer without an effective treatment. That's a personal statement, though, and it is more important to center on the fact that you and I are free citizens of a free country. If I wish to use marijuana for recreation, I should be allowed to do so. As long as I don't harm my neighbors, as long as I don't get on the roads and cause an accident, the government has no authority to tell me otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alred, your rebuttal, and to his specific point about recreational marijuana usage, where are you on that? And um, are you uh, have an opposing view for him? If so, explain, explain if you would. Well, as a prosecutor, I've got reservations about uh, recreational marijuana. I support a responsible medical marijuana program in Arkansas. I think that's what's on the table this year, and that uh, that's what ought to be on the table nationally and federally, so that all states have that. Um, we ought to say uh, that uh, Senator Bozeman has voted against this at every turn, except for one vote and he voted for veterans to be able to have access to it to deal with PTSD and other things in those states, Colorado, Washington, others that have legalized it for medicinal purposes. So he's going to tell the people of Arkansas who have cancer, who have PTSD from their service or something else that they can't have it. We, that's, there's a big divide on this issue here. Um, last thing I'll say, Larry, is that uh, Frank, many of y'all may not know, Frank's wife recently passed away a month ago today 
and he's been through a lot. And uh, Frank, I just want to let you know, as I've let you know privately, that our heart goes out to you, and, and we're thinking about praying for you as you're, you and your family are going through this time. Thank you, friend. Uh, ditto. A minute of the same feeling. Um, Thank you. On, on uh, rebutting that, add, you know, you, start, you talk about re responsible medicinal marijuana, and you, you took it a step further with, with recreational, which Mr. Elridge has a, has a different opinion. Mm -hmm. What is responsible medical marijuana usage? How would you define that? I would say it should be left up to a doctor and a patient. Nobody else should be involved in that decision. Only a doctor and a patient. Politicians, prosecutors, everyone else, mind your own business. As far as recreational marijuana, think about how often you've heard people say drugs and alcohol, don't ever let them get by with that. Alcohol is a drug. And in the same world, alcohol would be more strictly controlled than marijuana. Folks, I don't use marijuana. I have used it one time when I was in the United States Navy, 612 years ago, I think. <laughs> and unlike Bill, I liked it. But I realized that if the barracks master at arms came in, I was going to the brig. Whereas if I had a bottle of whiskey on the shelf, he would take the whiskey, take it home and drink it, and I would have no trouble. Crazy. I want to stay on domestic issues um, and, and, and those that affect Arkansas especially. One of the issues on the table is minimum wage. And we'll start with Mr. Gilbert. Where are you on an increase in the minimum wage and how do you see it balancing, um, you know, the argument between affordable uh, lifestyle for people who work for a living versus the argument from the business sector that it would cost jobs? I think it's obvious that it is going to cost jobs. It does cost jobs, it doesn't cost many. And the people who are hurt are the young and those who are just beginning and what the heck, they don't count, right? So we will put that burden on the shoulders of those who are just getting into the workforce, those who don't have experience, and we'll let everybody else reap the benefits of their sacrifice. Folks, I'm so tired of arguing against the minimum wage. I'm not going to say anything else against the minimum wage except that. But we're about to find out because cities and states across this country are implementing local minimum wages that are already impacting restaurant workers and other low-wage workers in those areas. It has been a theoretical argument at this point. Libertarians, me included, are against the minimum wage. Not because we're in the pockets of big business, but because we believe that the free market will settle those matters much better than government regulation ever could. If you want a minimum wage, Think about who's being hurt and decide if it's really worth it to harm the least among us to benefit the rest of us. In the real world, that's what a minimum wage does. Mr. Elwes, the argument on minimum, minimum wage balancing between uh, a, a livable wage versus hurting business, where are you on that? I support an increase in the minimum wage. I voted. Uh, on for in favor of the constitutional amendment in Arkansas in 2014 in favor of increasing the minimum wage it was on the ballot then and as a US senator I would participate in the national discussions about what that wage ought to be and for me I recognize the theoretical point uh, but we've had a minimum wage in this country for a long time I think it ensures that the least among us are paid a minimum wage um, and I have concerns that when we look at the incredible costs that, the, that people uh, down the income ladder have faced, trying to raise a family of four, uh, the poverty level of $25,000 a year, 550,000 Arkansans, Arkansans, as I mentioned, live at or below the poverty level, 20% of our population. Half of our population makes less than $40,000 a year. Um, I worry about the families and kids in that position and what our answer to them is about how they can realize the American dream. And I think we ought to count on the minimum wage to ensure some basic level of income uh, that they're not going to go below. 
um, provided that, that they're working and find jobs and that we have jobs available, which is another part of that. And so I want to address that part of your question as to jobs. Um, I also recognize that if you were to all of a sudden theoretically say triple the minimum wage, that that would not be a doable proposition for small businesses. Um, so there's a balance there, and that's the kind of discussion that I would seek to have with leaders in both parties in Washington uh, and with all people to try to arrive at that uh, perfect staggered increase that both encourages and fosters job growth and protects families that are scraping to get by. Is there a figure you like? I don't have a specific figure that I'm going to propose today. Um, there are a number of, of, uh, of hourly rate uh, wages that are discussed. Um, all I can say is that I would participate in those discussions and I do believe it needs to be higher than it is today. Well, Mr. Gilbert, is there a figure that you would accept if you contemplated an increase that you would accept? You know, just as a practical matter, I wouldn't oppose anything that's currently in force. And I appreciate Connor's recognition that if you triple that, you would be causing serious economic difficulties. But at the same time, we have to think of it from this perspective as well. At $15 an hour, an employee will be making more than a lot of people who are in the nursing field. CNAs may not make $15 an hour. And it would be unfair to ask a CNA to work for less than minimum wage so naturally, we're going to raise their wages, and then it begins. The truth of the matter is that the people who are affected by the minimum wage don't have two children. They aren't married. Most of them are first jobbers, people gaining experience, working other jobs, and in this economy, you may need two or three of those jobs. Mr. Edwards, count to that? Sure. Uh, I, you know, remember working all, while, all during school while I was in college and taking out student loans to go to college. And so I think regardless of who is in a minimum wage job, um, the wage ought to be higher. And we ought to approach it from the, the standpoint that I, that I laid out a, a minute ago. I think the reason that's important to, to students who are here at the university um, is because, it, for a lot of reasons, but there are a lot of costs that hit um, students 18 to 22 uh, or older that are trying to better themselves, get their education, make ends meet, pay tuition, take care of all the expenses they have to take care of. So I think it applies equally to um, the young and the old, to uh, families, to individuals, and uh, that's why I support a, a staggered increase in it. Just one or two more Arkansas-centric um, and then move on to some uh, national and then foreign issues. One, um, casino gambling. It's being contemplated in Arkansas, even in this county, um, where I think we, we did I start with Mr. Elbert last time? I think we'll start with Mr. Gilbert. It matters. If I lose track, if I lose track, <laughs> make it easy on yourself. Well, corral me if I lose track. Uh -huh. um, what do you think about the expansion of casino gambling here in this county? But in general, um, what's your thought on that? I think it's interesting that one of the biggest opponents, or two of the biggest opponents, are South Park. South Park, I wish. <laughs> the uh, the uh, dog track in West Memphis and the, uh, the horse track in Hot Springs, because the state of Arkansas has already picked two winners. We've made two groups filthy rich by giving them permission to basically print money. And now they don't want to share that boon with three others. And that's what's going to happen. If we pick three and put them in the three designated counties, then you can just make three more groups filthy rich for no particular reason. Well, there is a particular reason, because the state legislature and the governor will have a hand in deciding who those three people are, or those three entities may be. Guess who's going to do well by their friends once they get those three? It is corruption. It is base. It is wrong, and we have to reject it. Now, folks, if the Cherokee want to come over here, buy some property, throw up a nice casino, give free drinks, get us all drunk so we waste our money, I'm all for that. If you want to pool your money together, build a casino here on campus, split the proceeds with the, the college, I'm all for that. But don't let the government pick three entities and say, 
guess what? You won the lottery. They didn't even have to buy a ticket. All they have to do is buy politicians. Mr. Ellis, casino gambling in Washington County, in Arkansas, expansion, and just in general expansion of casino gambling. Well, I'm not categorically opposed to casinos, but I have serious reservations about this proposal that's on the table. I thought uh, Wynn Morris did a good job of outlining um, some of the serious concerns that are there, and I, I echo those concerns. Uh, you know, I, I think that the monopoly question um, with folks out of state is a good one. Uh, I think uh, I think if we're going to go down that road, there needs to be a much more robust discussion about how we should do that than this constitutional uh, amendment permit, permits. Um, and I've got concerns about it. Uh, but again, I'm not. You know, I think uh, having been in the community uh, banking and business uh, industry in Hot Springs, I see um, the benefits of Oakland to that area. Uh, and so I think it would be, uh, I'm certainly not categorically opposed to it. I just have serious concerns about this particular proposal. Mr. Gilbert, that was not, uh, you seem to be more adequately opposed. Are there some social ills you're concerned about? Because others would say there are some tax benefits. I mean, where do you, what, what is it about gambling and casino gambling that you, you especially are adequately opposed to? Thank you for the opportunity to clear that up. It is not cause of social concerns. Uh, as I said, if the Cherokee or somebody else wants to build one, I'm all for them using their money to provide that service to the voters and gamblers of Arkansas. My concern is getting government involved in it. Having government pick three entities to set them up is a recipe for corruption. You put politicians and money together and you're going to have corruption. Present company accepted. <laughs> So, Mr. Elridge, is, you know, this particular proposal, what is it? Is it, if you, some would argue if you don't have government oversight, there are opportunities for misuse inside the casinos, abuse, um, skimming, that sort of thing. What is it about this proposal that you don't like that you would be a little more amenable to casino gambling if something were cleaned up? In it, the it, it actually is the monopoly and regulatory aspects. So the, the monopoly provision is something I've got concerns about. Uh, and again, recent articles have laid that out. This does seem to be an effort to enrich three particular groups that would uh, have complete ownership of this and then therefore would be basically protected um, unless there were another constitutional amendment passed in their monopoly. I do have a major problem with that. Uh, I don't have a problem with a robust discussion in our state of whether that is uh, casino gambling is something we, as a road we want to go down or not. Um, I would want to participate in that discussion with an open mind to all sides of that issue because I see uh, benefits and drawbacks to it. Um, but if it were something that the people of the state of Arkansas decided that they wanted to do for revenue reasons, for job reasons, for other reasons, we should consider the downside. We should certainly have a regulatory regime that's robust, and it should be fair and open to all people. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not endorsing some future theoretical proposal. I'm just saying that's how I would uh, approach the issue and the discussion. Okay, thank you. I want to transition to a couple of issues that are a little more campus-centric, and then we'll get to some broader domestic and foreign issues. Campus-specific. Um, during the uh, presidential primaries, um, a Democratic candidate talked about uh, college tuition uh, and also uh, free college and also talked about student loan, eradicating student loan, free college, that sort of thing. Mr. Elrich, what do you think the answer is to, to college tuition, if not free college tuition, what's the answer to corralling uh, the, the spiraling cost? And what do you think uh, should be done with student loan debt? Well, it's a, it's a great question and a serious problem that we need to pay attention to. Uh, you know, I saw yesterday that student loan debt in this country has tripled to $1.3 trillion in the last decade. So let's think about that. That is astounding. Tripled. Uh, that debt is not just going to go away. Um, it's also the case that it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, in many situations to refinance student loans to lower rates. You can do that with a home. You can do that with a business. If rates go down, businesses and homeowners get to refinance and take advantage of lower rates. Why shouldn't students get that? 
Uh, and, you know, we have to point out here that there's a major distinction in this race. Senator Bozeman has a record of time and time again voting against student loan uh, and student debt relief. I have a major problem with that. I think this is a big issue for the future of this country. What is our answer to the students at the University of Arkansas um, who have to take on lots of debt uh, to get out of school, many of them? What's our answer? To, to the jobs that are going to be available that are, that are going to give them a foreseeable path to paying that off. If we don't have an answer to that, we've got to do something about it. And it is a complex problem. Parts of it are easy. You ought to be able to refinance your student loans. The cost of college ought to be lower. We ought to have more programs that allow it to be paid off, um, such as Teach for America and other things of, of that sort. But there's a bigger problem there um, that uh, that that we need to deal with, and that is the extremely high cost of education uh, in this country. And I mentioned Teach for America, you know, the, the, I think I was reading yesterday that there are a number of programs, um, some that I had not uh, even heard of, that if you go down a particular path, offer some debt relief, be they uh, in private business or be they public programs. I think those are good ideas. I think we ought to explore uh, more of them. Mr. Gilbert. Um High cost of tuition, there was a proposal during the presidential primary about free college and also um, some proposals to eradicate student loan debt. Where are you on both of those? Let me make sure I remember correctly. We're on the campus of the largest university in the state of Arkansas. They're not allowed to boo me, right? And is there somebody who will provide me security to get me off campus? There's something in the rules about booting. Okay, yes. Good. <laughs> then I'll answer honestly. The socialist Bernie Sanders is offering a program to a constituency that he desperately needed to give away hundreds of billions of dollars to that constituency, and we're twenty trillion dollars in debt. Folks, we ain't got the money. We can continue printing money that doesn't exist until the Fed printing presses make it, but ultimately, you are gonna lose. I'm gonna be dead before most of that comes due. You'll get to pay for it the rest of your life. Your children will pay for it for the rest of their lives, and your grandchildren well, you see where I'm going with this. It is time to recognize that we can't have free anything. The old saying that's abbreviated tangible, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch, is as true today as it was 50 years ago. And if someone offers you a free lunch, check your pocket when you leave the restaurant. Thank you. Mr. Elwood, so the, 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 uh, you heard his position. Is there a way to corral, to contain rising tuition? And um, if it's not free, how do you make it affordable? There is some argument that it's, it's elbowing out um, lower income people nowadays. Education has become something for elites. How do you make education more affordable? higher education. Well, we have to have an answer for the tuition question. I mean, you know, the, the obvious fact is that tuition can't continue to increase at the rate that it's increasing. Um, and I don't pretend that that's an easy answer. I know that the budgets of large universities like the University of Arkansas are complicated, um, but we, we have to find an answer. And you get that, you get there through intellectually honest debate. I support a, a discussion at the national level that I would participate in as a U.S. Senator of number one, how we lower the burden of student loan debt on students with loans and students in school today and students that will be in school next year, but then also how we reduce tuition costs. Uh, you know, it's a fundamental problem to me, and I'll finish with a story. Um, I have a friend who has $100,000 in student loan debt. He's 35. He has a 10th grader. What answer do we have as a country to how he and his wife are going to pay off their student debt, much less pay for college or help their, their 10th grader pay for college when he goes? There's something wrong with that. Their pockets are already too empty, and we need to deal with their problem first. What do you do about the people, Mr. Gilbert, who come from a demographic that makes college unaffordable for them and keeps them in a, in a status of, of the uneducated, basically? How do, how do you make college affordable? 
I believe you do it by getting the government less involved in the process. The United States government, the state of Arkansas, are in charge of most education. Pre-K to the U of A, it's all a government program. Now, Washita, where I went, is more expensive than, than the state schools. But that which we value, we're willing to pay for. And as far as specifics of how to reduce the cost for those who make less than the median income, I believe that if we allow the free market, Washita, Henderson, compete great, down there in Arkadelphia, one's a state school, one's a private. I believe we will find that free market solution, and if we don't, then we have to do something else. And like Connor, we don't have all the answers up here today, but we recognize that it's something that's going to have to be taken care of. We've got about 20 minutes left of the debate portion, and we'll go to the town hall portion. So I want to get to one more issue of a special concern to college age people. Um, you were in the Navy, and we're all familiar with the military. Um, one, one thing that, that, that college-age people in, in high school uh, is a concern is the draft. We've been at war for, um, since 2003, uh, and we're still at war in the Middle East. There's a big demand for troops. Some people are recycling back through several tours. Do you see any need to reinstitute the draft, and would you support it? Absolutely not. Having, having been in war, not myself personally, I was in the Navy during wartime, but when folks asked me if I was in the military, I said, no, I was in the Navy. And the Navy didn't have the kind of involvement that the other branches did during Vietnam. But folks, the draft, compulsory service, is slavery. It is slavery for a period of time. Perhaps we should call it indentured servitude. Maybe that will make it sound better. The ultimate result of that is a military that is disrupted, that is ineffective. The chief petty officers in the United States Navy who saw me and thousands of others come to them not because we were dedicated to the joining the U.S. Navy, but because we didn't want to join the Army and were about to be drafted into it, they can tell you what kind of Navy we had in 1968 to 1972. If you allow politicians to raise an army through indentured servitude, you'll never get out of war. There will be continuous war, as there has been, since you, as you say, since 2003. We're fighting a war on drugs. We're fighting a war on terror. 